Hi, guys. Man, it sure does seem like Holy Week was a long time ago. It is hard to believe that was just a week ago. Do me a favor. Let's turn to Ephesians together. If you turn, tap, scroll, we're going to start a verse-by-verse study through the book of Ephesians this morning. Ephesians chapter 1. So 27 times in this book, we're going to see the phrase, in Christ. And so believers are in Christ, but we are also in the world. And like a scuba diver, it is a wonderful environment, but it can also be dangerous or threatening. And you contemplate in an environment like being in Christ and being in the world, whatever culture you might find yourself in, how would you grow in Christ and transform your community for Christ? I think that's all of our desire. I imagine you're here because you want to grow in Christ. That was underwhelming. (laughs) Maybe we are all just tired. I know I'm tired, man. No excuse, but I'm just exhausted. Holy Week is an exhausting week in the church. And uh, I am praying that by God's Spirit, that he will energize me, he will energize us, that the fresh new beginning that we are all seeking will become a reality in our lives as we discover what it means to be in Christ. I'm going to pray, and then we'll take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Father, I just pray that by your Spirit, you would open up your Word, you would illuminate the pages of Scripture, that this good seed would fall on good soil and hearts that are receptive to you, that are inclined to yield to you, and that we would be a transformed people, that we would influence those that we live with, that we work with, that we study with, that we hang out and recreate with, and those that we worship with. And you're the only one who can do that. So we commit it to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're just going to start with two verses for an overview, and that's the subject we're talking about this morning, an overview of the book of Ephesians, an overview of Ephesians. And the object that I believe God intends for each of us is that we would grow in Christ, that we would grow in Christ. And so the first thing I want you to consider with me is what it means to follow Christ in Ephesus, following Christ in Ephesus. Ephesus. So we're first going to consider this idea of being faithful in Christ. So at the very beginning of the letter, as was the custom of the time, the author is identified and the recipients of this letter are identified. So Paul identifies himself as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. The term apostolos, the Greek term, simply speaks of one who is sent out on a mission. But in Paul's case, it also spoke to his title or his office as an apostle. He was uniquely commissioned by Jesus on the Damascus Road to proclaim this message of good news, the gospel, to primarily Gentiles, non-Jews. And so Paul describes himself as an apostle, one sent out with this commission to communicate the gospel by the will of God. It was nothing that he could aspire to, nothing that he could strive for, nothing that he could accomplish in his own strength, his own diligence, his own will. It was the will of God and became a reality for Paul. And so Paul introduces us to himself that way. We also consider this idea, where is Paul? So some of you are aware that this is one of Paul's Roman epistles. So Paul writes four letters while he's imprisoned on the first occasion in Rome. And this is one of those four letters. It's written about 60 AD. So Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon are the four prison epistles. So Paul's in Christ, in Rome, in prison. That's the setting. Who are the recipients of this letter? To the saints in Ephesus. 
So I want you to understand this term saint is used nine times in this letter. And the saint is simply a follower of Jesus, a believer of Jesus. The term literally means set apart ones. So if you were raised in the Roman Catholic tradition or the Catholic church, you had this idea that saints were these uh, very spiritual people who accomplished very influential works of service for God. And I want you to appreciate that all of you are saints. And I'm not just saying that to be kind, like, oh, you're all beautiful, you're all lovely. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are a saint. You are set apart to Christ. And so he says at the end of verse 1 that they were faithful in Christ. Faithful in Christ. Now, yesterday I had the privilege of going out on a group bike ride with some folks from this church, and we set up like a discussion question, what we're going to chat about on the ride or after the ride as we just come back and we have a time of prayer. We thank God that nobody crashed, typically. Um, and, And so the question that we teed up was, what are some of the challenges of following Christ in this culture? And I I was just very impressed by some of the answers that I heard from this group. He talked about things like busyness. Would you all agree that this is a very busy culture? And that's an obstacle to following Christ. You think about some of the challenges with sports recreation for kids as well as for adults that takes place on Sundays in other generations in this country. That wasn't as prevalent. You think about the advent just of media, the, the polarization of our nation and in many respects the world. The politicization of Christianity, Christian nationalism, recognized that Jesus is neither Republican nor Democrat. Jesus didn't come to save America. Jesus came to save Americans of the North and the South variety and Koreans of the North and South variety. And some of these issues become huge distractions to actually following Jesus. But I want you to appreciate that in any culture, in any time, following Jesus is going to be countercultural. So he talks about them being faithful in Christ. That is their identity. They are in Christ. And I want you to appreciate with me as we go through this letter together, verse by verse, week by week, till we get to its conclusion, we're going to discover what it means to be in Christ. In the first three chapters of this letter, Paul is writing about our identity as Christians. And that should be the primary identity of every single person in this room. That your primary identity is, I'm a follower of Jesus. I am a Christian. I'm a believer. I don't care what you call it. As long as you know that reality, that's your primary identity. Before your, your status as married, your status as a child, your status as a parent, your status in regard to your work or your school or your accomplishment or your, your recreation or your jam or anything else, you are in Christ. And so what does that mean? So at the very moment where you choose to yield your life to Christ in faith, you trust the gospel message that Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, became a perfect sacrifice as all God, all man for humanity. And it was proven, just as foretold by the prophets, when he rose on the third day. The resurrection, what we just celebrated last week, hallelujah. And when you choose to yield to his will, you choose to surrender, you choose to believe, then you receive forgiveness of your sin, the Holy Spirit is now in you, you receive a spiritual birth, and you are in Christ, and Christ is in you. So, these people are faithful in Christ. But I also want you to see with me, they are faithful in Ephesus. To the saints in Ephesus, faithful in Christ Jesus. So Ephesus, let's talk about Ephesus, shall we? All right. So I have had the privilege of of, um, being in Ephesus on two occasions. It is remarkable. So just to give you a sense, this is the largest city in the Roman province of Asia Minor, what would be modern-day Turkey. And so Ephesus is estimated to have a population of almost 300,000 people, which in the ancient world is giant. So it's this large city. It has the best harbor in the area. And so it is a thriving seaport. So all this commercial um, 
marketing is going into Ephesus, out of Ephesus. There's this tremendous wealth of, in Ephesus. Just to give you a sense of how wealthy Ephesus is, if you have the privilege of going to Ephesus today, you can walk on a street that has been excavated in terms of, of part of the ruins of Ephesus that is made entirely of marble. The entire street. You, can you imagine, like... You, you, you're being warned that the street is slippery because it's entirely marble. Whether it's raining or not, it's still slippery. The wealth is incomprehensible. So you imagine, okay, so here's this giant city, wealthy seaport. If you think about what happens in seaports, sailors, etc., it doesn't sound like the most moral place, but it gets even more, shall I say, interesting. There was the temple of Diana at Ephesus. To just have an, a sense, this is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It is characterized by 127 white marble columns, each measuring 60 feet in height. Now, that may not sound impressive until you recognize that here in the 21st century, we have two buildings in our entire county that measure that height or higher. Pretty impressive. So, Diana is not only the goddess of the hunt, she is the goddess of fertility. And so, the expression of worship of Diana is characterized by temple prostitutes offering their services to those who would want to honor the goddess. So, you just think about some of the challenges that we might face in our culture to being in Christ, growing in Christ, transforming our community in Christ. And I would say that the challenges in Ephesus in the first century exceed whatever you can imagine as a hurdle. You've got this incredible wealth, you've got immorality, you have sexual immorality specifically, and you have idolatry because the way that Diana is worshipped, people, silversmiths, make shrines, idols of Diana that people would then purchase and they would then bring those to their home or bring them back to wherever they lived because that was how they increased fertility, or so they thought. So you imagine that environment, and you think, this is not the ideal place to see a church planted and have influence and transform a community. Right? Right. Except the Holy Spirit moved in a mighty way. The church at Ephesus is arguably the most influential church in all of the New Testament, in all of the early church. Almost one-third of your New Testament is connected to Ephesus. Eight of the 27 books are connected to Ephesus. So we have this book, Ephesians. The book of Acts is connected to Ephesus. First and second Timothy connected to Ephesus. First, second, third John connected to Ephesus. And the Revelation connected to Ephesus. Matter of fact, when you get to Revelation 2 and 3, you read about seven churches, and Jesus writes letters to these seven churches. All seven of those churches are presumably church plants from the church at Ephesus. Remarkable. And it should also be really encouraging. Think about it. How did God move in Ephesus to transform that city, to transform a region, to, dare I say, transform the world from this one local church? And could he do it again? Wow. Well, I think it'd be probably helpful for us to get the backstory of how that church was started to understand how. So let's turn together to the book of Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. So as you tap, turn, scroll to Acts 19, we're going to consider how to grow in Christ. So beginning at verse 1 of Acts chapter 19. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have said not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Verse 4. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. 
when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, the men were about 12 at all. Okay, so first let's talk about the need of the Holy Spirit. So we see that Paul comes from Corinth to Ephesus. And as he comes to Ephesus, we see at verse 1 and at verse 7 that he finds 12 people who are disciples. And that term generally refers to people who are followers of Jesus. And so he asks this question at verse 2. Have you received the Holy Spirit? I have never started a conversation that way. I mean, I've been a pastor for years. I've never started a conversation that way. And I'm presuming that the conversation didn't start that way. But as Luke records Acts, Paul's asking this question. We have to ask ourselves, why? Why is Paul asking this question? And presumably, there was something about these people that gave Paul the impression that they weren't being led by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit wasn't working in their lives. There was no noticeable impact effect of the Holy Spirit. So at some point, these people were identified as disciples, and Paul said, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they're like, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit, verse 3. So Paul then asks the question, into what then were you baptized? Why does he ask that question? Well, if you've seen a baptism here, or you're going to be baptized here in a couple of weeks, we're going to baptize you and use the, the formula, so to speak, from Matthew 28. We baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So Paul's saying, like, what were you baptized into then if you haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit? And their response, we see at verses 3 and 4, that were baptized into John's baptism. So they're talking about John the Baptist. And as Paul notes, John the Baptist's primary message is to repent. In other words, change your thinking about God, change your thinking about sin, and align yourself or submit to God. And that's John the Baptist's message. But Paul goes, hey, you need to understand the place of Christ in this thing. So presumably Paul talked about the life, the death, the resurrection, and now the spirit-filled life that was available to them. And they want this. And so at verse 6, we, or at verse 5, going into verse 6, we see that Paul laid hands upon them, prayed for them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Okay, so that's the, the context of what's going on here. So Paul sees that something's missing in their life, talks to them about their need for the Holy Spirit, helps them to understand the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, and then invites them to receive the Holy Spirit. So we're not going to do that. No, I am going to do that. So let's understand about the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus in John chapter 14 at verse 17, he explains that the Holy Spirit will be in the world to bring conviction of sin. So the Holy Spirit is with people to help them to understand their need for a Savior, that they are separated from God. And so the Holy Spirit is working in the world, doing that work all around the globe. And then when someone yields their life, submits to Christ, believes, they receive the Holy Spirit. And again, John 14, verse 17, then the Holy Spirit is in you. Now, here we see that the Holy Spirit comes upon these believers in Ephesus. So I don't know anything about English grammar, but here's a preposition lesson. So far we've seen with, we've seen in, and our third preposition for today is Upon, and, and so the Holy Spirit now comes upon them, indicating another aspect of the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you'll be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, in Judea, in the southern part of Israel, moving north to Samaria, and then to the outermost parts of the world. The whole book of Acts describes this unfolding as the Spirit is poured out upon the church. But he had said to the disciples in Jerusalem when he met them in the upper room, do not try to represent me, do not go and represent me until you've received the Holy Spirit. That would happen days later at Pentecost, 
Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church, the Holy Spirit comes upon believers. So we see this experience of the Spirit being with us, drawing us to Christ, the Spirit being in us, and then the Spirit coming upon us. So this term, the Spirit coming upon, is also referred to in the New Testament as the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. So later in this letter, when we get to the fifth chapter, we're going to see those terms used They're used throughout the New Testament. And they're synonymous terms. So I want you to understand this. The issue isn't that you're lacking some of the Holy Spirit. It's not like there's a spiritual dipstick and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm a quart low. Fill me up with the Holy Spirit. The, the, you have all the Holy Spirit that there is. The issue isn't that you need more of the Holy Spirit. The issue is, does the Holy Spirit have you or me? So we also see that we can grieve the Holy Spirit, we can quench the Holy Spirit when we're not yielding to God's empowerment, God's leading, God's conviction by his Spirit. Now, I think if you, if you take anything away from the teaching today, and I, I hope that you will, what I hope is, is the most important thing, at least from my perspective, however God speaks to you is, is great. I mean, I recognize I, I could stand up here and read the alphabet, and somebody would go, oh, pastor, when you said ABC, I was so encouraged. And, and somebody else would like, oh, when you said LMN, I was so convicted. And somebody else could say, oh, when you said X, Y, Z, that just brought me so much joy. And somebody else could say, when you said Alpha, Beta, Gamma. And I'm like, I did not even say Alpha, Beta, Gamma. What are you talking about? But if God is going to move by his spirit, whatever he is going to teach you today is going to be glorious. But if there was one thing that I think is really important for us to understand it's the need for the Holy Spirit. The Christian life is primarily a spiritual experience. We have a very high regard for the Word of God in this place. We teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through books of the Bible here. And so we hold up the Word of God as it should be held up, as a pillar, as a ground for the truth. But apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, we can make this simply an intellectual ascent, which is not what the Christian life is about. The Christian life is not simply knowing information about Jesus. The Christian life is not simply knowing Bible verses. The Christian life is being transformed by the Word, by the Holy Spirit, to be more like Jesus. And that process takes time. So we create an environment here where people are accepted in Christ. This is not about better morality. This is about being in Christ. You are accepted in Christ. And so you should be accepted here because of you being in Christ or contemplating Christ. This is not about your performance. This is not about your perfect morality. It's all about Jesus and his performance. So we create an environment where you're accepted. We create an environment where you are loved. And then we create an environment where the word of God is taught and you're encouraged to learn the word of God and God's spirit moves. And if you give that enough time, people are transformed. This is the story of God's redemptive plan. And so I want you to understand with me all of our desperate need for the work of the Holy Spirit. We believe the Holy Spirit is working today just as he did in the early church. And he wants to do that in all of our lives. He's just simply waiting for us to ask. In, in Luke chapter 11, just speaking of the Holy Spirit says, as soon as you ask, God is going to give you his Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. He's saying to us, look, you being earthly parents, if your child comes and says, hey, pop, can I have some fish? Can I have some bread? Can I have an egg? No earthly parents can say, oh, here's a scorpion. Here's a snake. Like if you, being earthly and flawed, know how to give your children good gifts, how much more is the Father going to give you of his Holy Spirit? 
And so I want to ask you, who would like to receive the Holy Spirit right now? Who would like just to have the, the sense of yielding to receive the Holy Spirit? Yeah, if you want to, just stand up right now. If you're ready, if God is moving in your heart, amen, 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 amen. Just stand up. There's nothing to be ashamed, nothing to be frightened. Like, we need the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, this is nothing I'm trying to manufacture, nothing that I have any desire to manipulate in the least. I trust that you're moving, and by your Spirit, we are just seeing our need for your Spirit. We're responding to you, Lord. We, we want to be transformed people. We desperately want to be like you. We're keenly aware that we're not yet. We praise you, Lord, for the transformation, the progress that we've been able to experience and that others have borne witness to, Lord. But we just recognize that we're so far from what we want to be in you. And Lord, it's not us getting more disciplined. When we accept that that's part of it. It's not us knuckling down. It's not us. It's about you. And we desperately, we're crying out, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Help us to yield to you. Help us to see our need for you, our, our desperate need for you to empower us, to you to guide us, for you to strengthen us. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Praise God. Have a seat. Let's trust that God's responding to that prayer. Praise God. So, we see, first of all, the need for the Holy Spirit. Second, the need for the scriptures. Beginning at verse 8. And he went to the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So Paul's custom when he comes to a new city is he starts to uh, go to the synagogue because there the Jewish believers have a sense of the true and living God. They know the Old Testament scriptures. And Paul engages in this practice as described at verse 8 of persuading and reasoning. So he's using logic, using persuasion to show Jewish people that Jesus is their Messiah, that he is the Christ, that the kingdom of God is now being realized and is available to us. It's not an earthly kingdom. It's not a military kingdom. It's not a political kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom that is inhabited by people who have yielded their lives to Jesus and will be fully realized in the Later dispensation, when Christ comes in his second coming and sets up his eternal kingdom, and we spend eternity in glory with him in a new heaven and a new earth that is better than Eden, better than your favorite vacation place, better than this creation that has been damaged by sin. And so he's explaining these things, and people are coming to faith, and he's reasoning daily. And then some of the Jewish leaders oppose Paul. So what Paul does is he says, fine. And he leaves the synagogue and he goes to the school of Tyrannus. So <laughs> Tyrannus is Latin for tyrant. This must have been a fun place to go to school. <laughs> you just think like, if you think I'm giving you a hard time, imagine this guy. And so in Ephesus, modern day Turkey, it gets warm during the middle of the day. And, and so we think about in, in maybe our cultural context of Spain, Mexico, Latin countries, and taking a siesta in the midday heat. And that's what's going on at the school of Tyrannus. So there's this hall that's available. So Paul now uses this hall to start teaching daily in the school of Tyrannus, to all who wanted to come. It'd be like going to school of discipleship, and you show up, and you learn about Jesus, and he explains the scripture, and you start to understand more and more the word of God. And typically, when Paul went to a place, he didn't stay there long. But at Ephesus, he was there for over two years, almost three years, we learn in Acts chapter 20. And when he gathered the elders, the elders from the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, we discover that he taught them the whole counsel of God. In other words, he didn't avoid difficult topics. 
He didn't avoid something that may have been countercultural. He didn't avoid subjects that were in the scripture. He taught the whole counsel of God. Didn't pass over anything. Yeah. So just that you guys appreciate. How many of you in the room have seen uh, the food show Chopped? Just anybody? Okay. So we got some people... I'm not endorsing it, but I want you to understand the premise of this show is you have this box of ingredients and you have to use all the ingredients. And so there's an appetizer, there's an entree, and then a dessert. And each contestant, one contestant gets chopped after each course so that only one's left. But they don't know what's in the box of ingredients when they open it up. It could be like maraschino cherries and anchovies. And you're like, what am I going to do with this? That's what it's like for us as teachers in this place here comes Sunday morning. Like, I don't know what's coming in the next portion of Scripture, but I have to use all of those ingredients. I don't get to bypass any. I don't get to skip over any. This is just like chopped in the sense that there's a time limit. Sunday shows up. I can't say, hey, come back tomorrow. I'm not ready. It's like, no, this is the time. And I have to use all the ingredients, and I have to plate this so that it is nourishing to you as well as pleasing to you. That's, that's what's going on. And this is what Paul did. He didn't shun from teaching the scripture. When he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 16, he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God might be complete, lacking nothing. So next time you come upon those genealogies and you're like, oh my gosh, double eye roll, genealogies, I don't even know how to pronounce these names. Just trust that God has a purpose in there and that all of those people are known to God. All of those people influence God's kingdom and you have your rightful place among them. And so Paul's teaching the word of God because apart from the word of God, you cannot become a mature disciple. Remember when Jesus instructed the early church about making disciples, he said, teaching them all things that I have taught you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Bible learning is something that we want to do here on Sunday mornings, but that's just to whet your appetite, right? If, if this is the only Bible learning that you're getting, you are going to be malnourished. You need more of the Bible. You need to love the Word of God, learn the Word of God, live the Word of God. And so I'd ask you to consider, what are you reading right now in the Bible? How are you learning the Word of God right now? If you're listening on, on an app where you're hearing the Word of God and you're an auditory listener, praise God. Um, some of you, it's like you watch, you watch like The Chosen. You watch movies about the Bible. Because, like you can remember every single line in Princess Bride. So you're just like, if I watch it, I'll know the whole thing. And I'm not saying that that's wrong or bad. Not, not at all. But recognize that as producers, as directors, as writers have sought to, what's the word? I don't know. Um, Holy Spirit, help. Uh, I don't know. They're, they're trying to understand what may have gone on. And, and so there's some conjecture. And, and so the best thing is to be learning the Word of God. If people say to me, what, what's the best Bible translation, Pastor Ruth? I, I teach from the New King James because I learned all these verses that I'm now quoting to you in the King James. And so it would be really awkward if I was quoting a verse in the New King James that you are looking at the NIV or the NLT or the NASB or the ESV and you're seeing it on the screen, but I'm saying something completely different. So that's why we teach from that here. But the best Bible translation, and, and there's countless really good translations, is the one you're reading. That, that's the best, you know. People say to me, oh, Pastor Bruce, I just want to hear from God. Read the Bible out loud. <laughs> You'll hear from God. Right? You, you have to understand that we need the scriptures. And, and so Paul continues this for almost three years. And what we discover at verse 10 is that the word of God, the, the gospel, 
And the message of Jesus spread, not only throughout Ephesus, but the whole region, it says. In other words, this whole Roman province of Asia Minor was impacted because people were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were learning the Word of God. They were loving the Word of God. They were living the Word of God. And so their lives were set apart as distinct from others in the culture. They weren't shaking a fist, like there's something wrong with you people, you're all going to hell. It wasn't that message. It was the message that there is a better life available to you. There is a better way to live available to you. I I have a problem that on universities and college campuses, almost any message is okay to be communicated unless trying to communicate the message of Jesus and his gospel. Now, I'm not shaking a fist. I I don't think the world's going to hell in a handbasket. I haven't given up hope. The reason why I find this offensive is that I think in, in a culture that is supposedly characterized by free speech, that we have an ideal in that because we have the best message available to anyone anywhere on the planet. The message of Jesus and his gospel. And I am happy to wage into that discussion with anyone with a different worldview. Not to tell them that they're an idiot, not to tell them they're immoral, not to tell them they're bad, but to tell them that there is a better way to live that's available in Jesus. And I am happy to engage in that conversation any opportunity that I can. This is what Paul was talking about in reasoning and persuading. When you have a transformed life that is different than your neighbor's life, and they see that there's something better in how you're navigating all of the difficulties of this life, that you're not condemning them as being immoral people, but you're loving them as Jesus loves, that you're engaging people who are separated from God because you want to see them find their way back to God. I desperately want to see Camarillo reach for Christ. I I mean, um, it is easy to love a place like this, right? Um, the, The very name, it's the Pleasant Valley. But do you love this place that you're willing to sacrifice your comfort To actually talk to people where you live, where you work, where you play, where you go to school, even where you worship, about Jesus. When the Holy Spirit came upon these believers at Ephesus, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Tongue is a language of praise directed to God in a language that is unknown to the speaker. Prophecy is from God through men to encourage or edify believers, either foretelling the future or foretelling the heart of God. When the Holy Spirit comes upon people, there's going to be transformation manifest. But the most common manifestation of the Holy Spirit throughout the New Testament is boldness to talk about Jesus. And I just want to encourage you. I understand it's hard. I'm I'm not living in an ivory tower. I've worked in the marketplace. I have relatives who don't know Jesus. I live in this community. I understand all the challenges. But we need the Spirit to give us boldness, to be ambassadors, to represent Jesus, because that's where transformation is taking place. So let me just real briefly summarize for you the transformation that came about by the work of the Holy Spirit and through the scriptures. Uh, First, uh, there is growth in Christ that transforms individuals and communities. And I'm going to give you three examples. First, grace and peace. In Ephesians 1, at verse 2, Paul's typical greeting is grace and peace to you. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Peace is something that we experience with God when we receive Christ. You have peace with God. You're no longer an enemy God. But then you experience the peace of God as a result of growing in Christ. Second, people turn to God. So further on in Acts chapter 19, we see that people turn from idolatry, they turn from the occult, they turn from sorcery, they turn from false religions and philosophies 
and came to Christ. It got so bad for the silversmiths who were making these idols of Diana that a riot broke out in the city because they're trying to oppose Paul and the message that he was proclaiming that transformed their community. And third, the community becomes saturated with Jesus and his gospel. I, I praise God. God, there are 75 small groups in this church, neighborhood groups, that people are talking about Jesus everywhere in this community. I praise God that streets are being blocked with cars that are parking there for small groups. I'm, I'm not endorsing that idea of blocking someone's driveway, but when 10 cars show up on a Wednesday night, somebody's going to ask, what's going on here? It's an opportunity to invite people in, that, that the presence of God is manifest, saturating this community. I'm going to tell you one last thought before we transition to communion. When we talk as missiologists, people who uh, study the influence of the mission of the church around the globe, they talk about unengaged people groups where the gospel has never been presented. They talk about engaged people groups where the gospel is being presented to a people group. And then they talk about reached people groups. Now, if you asked you, what percentage of people in a population in an ethnos, in, in a people group, needed to uh, convert to Christianity, needed to receive Christ to be a reached people group? I'm going to encourage you that the, whatever percentage you're thinking, it's going to be significantly higher than the actual amount. You only need to reach 2% of a people group for it to become reached. See this. Paul started with 12 disciples. 12. And that church spread the message of Christ around the globe, literally. So, I want to encourage you, if you want to make a difference in your life, if you want to make a difference in your community, if you want to see this all transformed, we have an opportunity right now, right here. The ushers are going to come forward and present to us the elements of communion and ask you to hold and we will partake of them together. So in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, Jesus writes the letter to the church at Ephesus. And he commends them. He affirms them. He says, look, you're doing good work. He affirms them. Look, you know good doctrine. And you recognize false doctrine, false teaching. And you don't tolerate it. So he affirms them. He praises them. He gives them this commendation. But then he gives them correction. He says, I have this one thing against you, that you've left your first love. In other words, they understood good doctrine. They were doing good works. They understood and rejected false teaching. But Jesus stopped being the master passion of their lives. And so Jesus gives them the antidote. He says, remember what it was like when I was the master passion of your life. Repent. In other words, recognize that you've let something else be the master passion of your life and confess it to God. Acknowledge that he has the rightful place to be the master passion of your life and mine. And then he urges them to redo. Do the things that you were doing when you were so in love with me. Communion reminds us of Jesus' love for us, God's love for us to give us his only son, that everything that happened in his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, all demonstrate to us that God's got everything under control, that he loves us, and therefore, we should make him the master passion of our lives so that we're transformed, the people we care most about will be influenced positively, and we will change this community for Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Father, I just thank you that you're moving in our midst. I thank you, Lord, that you're transforming. I thank you for all the transformation I've been able to bear witness to here for nearly 30 years now. 
And Father, I recognize that the best is yet to come. Until you come to gather your people, Lord, you are always moving. And help us, Lord, not to quench that. Help us not to grieve. Help us to be filled with your spirit as we pray that we might be transformed and transform others. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake. Thank you.